Hey there, Monster Hunters, I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. And any expert knows that avoiding an aboleth's mucousy discharge is half the battle in defeating it. But that doesn't mean they're nothing to sneeze at. Let's get to it on WebDM. Oh my god, aboleths. The aberrations of the deep. The great old ones of D&D. &D. The, great, the great old ones of D&D. &D, everyone's favorite giant psychic catfish monster. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Aboliths are, are a monster that, I'll be honest, I forget about as part of the Dungeons and Dragons lore. And it's mm -hmm. probably easy to. There are a lot of, like, scary, psychic, mind-controlling, like, alien-type monsters in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, right? most aberrations. Right, most aber we're talking about most aberrations. <laughs> uh, you know, certainly mi there's a lot of overlap in, in Aboliths between like mind flayers mm -hmm. and, and, there's, and there's even some thematic similarities between them and like um, beholders. Uh, if, our, if our viewers ever get a chance to get their hands on the third edition Lords of Madness book, even if it's just in PDF form, it is an amazing trove of lore about aberrations in the far realm. Uh, and a lot of cool stuff. So it, that's just as an aside. If you ever get a chance to spot one, uh, snatch that up. But they're a creature that suggests a less fantastical background to the world. Yeah. Right. They they suggest a, a more evolutionary, naturalistic background to a Dungeons and Dragons world where there's millions and millions of years of evolution, and and it's not gods creating the the various races of the world like whole cloth. It's this process that happens, and so maybe aboliths are the only creature on a D and D world that evolved, and everything else was created by a god or a wizard mm -hmm. or a something or other, and that's why these aboliths have this chip on their shoulder. It was like, it was just us and the beasts here. Yeah. Right? We were the first. And then you came down and polluted our world with these just yammering apes. Yeah. And, you know, these... And kicked us out. <laughs> we are from the deep sea. The deep sea is primordial. It's where all life emerges from. It mm -hmm. is where perhaps the first sentient life, uh, you know, if, if we're making our own history fantastical, then the ab aboliths are, are somewhere around the Triassic period with these amazing, you know, cities and civilizations and the like, and they were here millions of years before we were, and they will be here after we're gone. Yeah. And they're going to remember all of it. They're not well, going to forget a single thing. <laughs> yeah, they do have pretty, uh, pretty good memories, right? I mean, <laughs> like being able to remember from the beginning and that being passed down through generations. Yeah, yeah. So like having that anger yeah. of the original, like the gods going, yeah, no, no, no. You no, no, need no, to go and get out of here. It's our turn now. You got, yeah. you got you had this place to yourself for, for who knows how long. For who knows how many eons, but you know, while they were fighting their gods war up in heaven, the abolists are <laughs> creating their own uh, civilization. Who knows how many you know, Aboleth Socrates have existed that, you know, have plumbed the depths of philosophy and mm -hmm. science for their uh, culture. I bet the Aboleths built the pyramids. Sure, yeah, exactly. Or, right. Well, at least they got people. <laughs> at least to, they got there. They, they, they got people to sure. build them. Oh, yeah, they had to. Well, of course, the Aboleths came down those alien spaceships to the flat earth that we all call home. <laughs> um, uh, so that's the Aboleth that I like in Dungeons & Dragons, right? This right. psychic catfish that, that enslaves people that hits like a truck. Right, yeah. like we'll get into sort of like building an encounter with one and, and sort of their characteristics as a monster, but like as a villain, as a, as a force in your campaign, mm -hmm. if you have them in your campaign, they, are, they have been there for a long time. They have a memory of your world. Yes, yes they do. And that's a powerful thing. My original Spelljammer campaign, y'all got to tangle with Kalsartan. Yes, we did. Who was behind the healing potion mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. He was working with the, the, with the humans. Potions, uh -huh. yeah. uh, that was the front for it, but... It's all that was all testing to try to try to control this egg of this giant cosmic Gosh, beast. We had to stop him because uh, he was basically a tapeworm yeah. in Godzilla. <laughs> like that's basically what it was because he right. wanted to control this beast from within. Yeah, and like why not? Right? Why not? That was a fun fight. Like that was. Uh, it was. I mean, it, it was a fun fight, and I, I think like getting into the like how to tackle an abolith. There are some things that you want to keep in mind. I, I think like building an encounter. Mm -hmm. You know, it, this is one of the monsters where you don't want to like just throw one at the party on, on like a random encounter or something. No. You, this is a monster that you want to deliberately place in your campaign world to figure out how it fits. What web of minions and plots and schemes does it sit in the middle of? Mm -hmm. And, and, and then you know all the different ways that the players will start like running into those threads and the Aboleth will 
you know, swim along them to to find them. So, like, backing up a minute, where you know they they know everything about your campaign world because they've been around there for a while. Creatures have worshipped them like gods since the beginning. Aquatic creatures and things mm-hmm. like that. They they are somehow the enemies of the gods. These are the sort of plots that an Abolith is going to get caught up in. And then once the players bumble around this <laughs> yes. for a while, uh, they start getting into those situations where they're now they're tangling directly with the Abolith. They're, right, they're approaching right. its lair. They're in the they're in the area where it is. Made made its lair and sort of like can find evidence of its presence and so they make a good like mid-level campaign villain in that regard they they, they're really sort of like a you know the the apex of like a tier two campaign Mm -hmm. or something like that where where you're like finally come to grips with the enemy that's been the mastermind behind whatever and it's an abolith or something you know you're like what the fuck yeah yeah <laughs> and that comes splashing uh, splashing across the pond <laughs> right just like okay <laughs> guys check let's get out of here aboliths have been around so long and if they if, if in my view they're sort of like the project of evolution as opposed to like the, the project of magical creation how many monsters are they responsible for like for like nurturing along their evolutionary paths to some kind of thing like mm-hmm. I, my personally, I, I like the idea of like them uplifting octopi into elithids. Yep. We're gonna take these octopi and we're just gonna like just nudge them along an evolutionary path so that they create brain worms that can live inside humanoids and take over the humanoid host and eat its brain out. And it's just like, yeah, that sounds like something an abolith would do. Elithids are their uh, the scourge that they set loose upon the, the right. peoples. <laughs> right. Like, oh, God, you did this to us with them? We'll do this to you and then <laughs> let them loose. And then the elithids, of course, spawn a wave of enslavement themselves, which uh-huh. catches the Darrow and the Dwergar and the Gith, who are actually humans and uh-huh. all this other stuff. And then, you know, so it's at, it's aboliths are at the root of it. And then the, the one in the monster manual, I think, is like, those are just the grunts. That CR-10 that's in the Monster Manual, that's just the, those are just the foot soldiers yeah. that the Abolists were capable of, uh, of summoning. So I, I think like in, in that, uh, that, those are things that I think a Dungeon Master should sort of take into account whenever they're thinking about using a monster like an Abolith. Because just like having it in the water when they're like, say, swimming in an underground river or exploring uh, you know, in the ocean depths, just like kind of having one around as a random monster they can encounter, doesn't do this one justice. Yeah. It, this one needs this is like a dragon or this is like a dragon or a big demon or something like that you need to consider where it fits in your world uh, before moving on to like plunking a miniature down that the party has to deal with <laughs> I mean you don't necessarily have to uh, tip them off that it's an abolith but no. there's obviously clues there's clues sure because yeah. uh, you know abolith they do love their love themselves some minions oh, um, <laughs> yes they do they have a really like let's let's kind of like go through a couple of their abilities yeah yeah uh, first first and foremost their enslave ability uh-huh right? yeah it's pretty tasty like it I mean like if that for 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 beings of that have some kind of like enthrall or enslavement or whatever mm-hmm. like it is like pretty much the best, right? I mean, it's indefinite yeah. unless... Once a creature is enslaved, and once they've failed their saving throw against this ability, it lasts indefinitely until the Abolith dies or is on another plane. The only way the Abolith has to be on another plane is if it dies and its body's reforming on ele- in elemental water, uh, the plane of elemental water. So it's not like there... It's not like, say, a night hag... Uh, or something else that can plane shift uh, a, a certain number of times a day and, and might be on another plane. It's sort of like if an abolith's on the material plane, this is kind of its its home. In, in, in some respects, it's sort of like it doesn't quite fit the aberration in terms of like source of origin. You know, other, most aberrations have their source of origin outside the material plane. They're mm-hmm. somewhere else. Aboliths originate from here. This is sort of their home even though they have a connection to elemental water. How often is it gonna to go to another plane? And it, it might die, which would free the, the person from enslavement. That might be the only way you can make sure that you like rescue someone from this Abolus control, but it's gonna come back. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they reform and, and they will find their way back uh, and they'll remember everything. They know who you are, they'll find your children if they have to, or your grandchildren, or 10 generations later, uh, whoever. But that enslave is powerful, right? Like mm-hmm. no other creature that I can think of, not mind flayers, uh, even uh, even the Neogi's enslave ability doesn't only last that long, yeah. only a day. And so I look at enslave, personally, I, I like giving enslave to mind flayers. <laughs> I like just like, replacing their enthrall or whatever it is ability with enslave um but abolith it's it's very powerful and it means 
in conjunction with their mucus and the disease that they potentially infect you with on a tentacle hit, it creates this sort of codependency. Uh, the, the, the parts of the Avalos work really well together in that respect. Yeah. It tries to communicate with you telepathically, waits for someone to answer back so that it knows the desires of that person if it can also sort of see them while it's communicating with them. It picks the person who has the desires that are most conducive to it being enslaved. Yeah. and then finds the weakest link there. And then it enslaves them. It makes sure that they can't leave the water without taking acid damage from the tentacle. And it makes sure that the only way they can survive underwater is to be within five feet of them once every couple of hours so that they can breathe under there. And at that point, does it matter if they're enslaved? Like, they're, they can't leave the water. They're not going to be able to breathe that long outside of it. Mm -hmm. Like, you're stuck with the abolith and maybe it doesn't enslave you today but it might tomorrow it's tried every day for as long as you've been stuck down here with it and you're at the bottom of a you know an ocean crevasse or or some sort of a subterranean underwater cavern or something how are you going to get out again mm -hmm. you know do you breathe underwater do you have a swim speed like it's that kind of monster and in that respect it's like can be very scary for a party you know that is the point uh <laughs> Is to be to be creepy as hell and to drive you insane. You, like you, seeing things that aren't there with its phantasmal. Like if you're in the lair, yeah. mm -hmm. you can use their their greatest desires against them. They have phantasmal force as a lair action, and you know phantasmal force is one of the few illusions that does damage. It doesn't do a lot, but you can use it to cause. I like phantasmal force less for its potential to do damage and more for its potential, its role playing potential. You can use it to send mental images to a target, and if you know what that target most desires, if you've been communicating with that target telepathically, then you can make it maybe see something that is relevant to that desire and kind of manipulate it. Now, it, this is where using an abolith outside of an encounter, the DM wants to have a really light hand. If they don't want to tip it off that something's going on, then you know a masterful use of illusions as a, a dungeon master is you gotta get really good at lying and you've got to get a really good poker face, mm -hmm. and you got to get really good about shutting up about your secrets, and you have to just present information in a neutral manner so that it doesn't seem out of the ordinary. Remember those old cartoons where you could like tell which part of the cartoon the, the character was going to interact with because it was drawn differently than the rest of the background? The background that was all static? That was all static, yeah. and then there's like two vivid mm -hmm. you know, uh, objects there. That's You need to avoid that. Because if you're the kind of DM that doesn't usually describe certain things, and then you start describing them, you're gonna you're gonna like tip off your players. They're gonna be like, "Why did you describe that?" Yeah. Uh, so you. He only describes things that we're supposed to mess with. Right, and, and by that same token, you know, you need to know what your character, what your player characters desire before they encounter the abolith, so that once the character communicates back with the abolith, the, as a dungeon master, you already know the answer to what they most mm -hmm. desire. You don't have to ask, you don't have to prompt them. You can just sort of, uh, you know, you just know that information because you've been paying attention, asking them questions before, you know, you've been building the campaign off of their feedback and you're, you know, you, you just should know. Uh, if you want this to be a satisfying, like, role-playing encounter before initiative is rolled, that is. We went through the abilities, got the mucus, got the tentacle hit. Oh, yeah. We got a really high perception, so they can spot those people really trying, high to, perception, trying yeah. to sneak up on them. And, and to be able to perceive as a lair, or as a legendary action yeah. as well. So it's going to be difficult to sneak up on them. I, I kind of wish that they had, like, a blind sense or, or a tremor sense or something. I know mm -hmm. they've got 120 feet of dark vision, but it would be... Need yeah. if they had an, a way to like uh, see through uh, obscurement of some kind. 120 feet of dark vision, the, the perception score that they have, it's going to be difficult to to sneak up on them if if they're mm -hmm. uh, you know or unless they're like completely taken by surprise. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but especially if they're in their in their their domain, their lair, their their right. home field. Yes. So let's start talking about some different kinds of home field that fields yeah. that the abolith could have because. Uh -huh. They do like to be in water. They need to be in water, even well, though they are amphibious. A ten foot land speed is not, <laughs> not where you want to find yourself. Well, and particularly because when you think about the fact that they've got a forty foot swim speed, but unless the characters have a swim speed, they're moving at half their speed, mm -hmm. right? So you're talking about a forty foot swim speed versus a fifteen foot probably swim speed that the uh, you know the party will have. Being out of water is bad move 
for yeah. it. I can't imagine a scenario in which the Aboleth would want to be out of water or or like would desire it un unless it like was making some just final desperate move to try to, to, to get an enemy uh, mm -hmm. or some kind. So you stay in the water and... and uh, and don't leave it. <laughs> bring the enemy, bring your, bring your party to the water, not well, the yeah. Aboleth to the party. Yeah, <laughs> and fortunately enough, they have a layer action that allows them to do that. Right, they do. You know, so if you get within 20 feet, they can, the tide can come out and mm -hmm. kind of rip, like, you know, rip pull you, them, rip you in. Water, yeah. What kinds of layers will determine a lot of the sort of encounters and minions that they'll mm -hmm. have, right? A, a, a deep ocean layer for an Aboleth might have a lot of sharks and oh, yeah. and octopi and, and you know, giant octopi and giant versions of those uh, of those creatures that around that it uses just to sort of uh, you know, mind controls them, keeps them close, barriers and, and and waves that they can send after a party. One way that I'm kind of thinking how I would run an Aboleth fight in like a deep sea sort of environment is. Uh, or any sort of environment is to use its uh, regional effect to be able to cause an illusory image of itself to appear and then have a you know a wave of sharks and giant octopus and maybe like a, you know hulking crabs and things like that after the party and then its illusory images in the back someone's going to try to waste it or cast some big spell on it or big attack or something they waste it there the illusion is revealed for what it is they still have to fight the wave of big monsters but that's the beginning of where the abolith starts to wear down the party as yep. they make their way towards uh, you know wherever they think it is and it might constantly keep those illusions up to try to distract the party, lead them down dead ends, mm -hmm. uh, have them waste their resources trying to uh, trying to get to it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, deep ocean's fun. Uh, <laughs> it's fun to think about these things in like either a small pond or a lake. Yeah, like you yeah. have a lakeside town, like a Loch Ness kind of thing. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, this is a, a creature that was stuck here after the glaciers receded mm -hmm. and has been here ever since and, and its kingdom has gotten that much smaller it's it used to be everything uh -huh, uh -huh. It used to be on the entire ocean now right. it's just in this little pond yeah now it's a petty tyrant of a small <laughs> of a small but very deep lake i, <laughs> I really like that because you do you could have like fishing situations and then like a, a shadow over insmouth situation where the villagers here are just a little too fish-eyed Mm -hmm. A little too, a little too clammy skinned, uh, you know. They're a little too good at, 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 you know, deep, deep lake diving or whatever it is that they're doing. Tip the party off that something's going on as this abolith has corrupted the populace of these fishing villages, who of course worship it as the god that it is. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, offer it, uh, offer it things. <laughs> Another fun one uh, it's to think about is like a like a large like rainforest type uh, river, like yeah. the Congo or the Amazon. Uh, yeah, just like all the tree cover, uh -huh. and just just miles of water. Yeah, and you yeah. don't know how deep it is at any given uh -huh. point. Yeah. Like that's that would be creepy. That would be creepy, and and you know the water is murky. You can't see in it, and mm -hmm. like any sort of swampy or or like sort of area or area of standing water and vegetation. There's that. I find them very claustrophobic. Yeah. They're like getting in the water is not something you want to do. It's not a. You can't see what's in there. Your legs and feet are vulnerable. Something could just pop right up out of the water, and you might not know it. Plus, there's everything that's going on above you. There could be snakes and other sorts of creeping things that are trying to like strangle you or grab you or something. Yeah. yeah if, if I was a, an abolith in a in a in a swampy place like that, it'd be all anacondas and crocodiles and mm -hmm. like river dolphins that try to you know just knock the party's boat over. Yeah, or, sawfish. Yeah, yeah, things like that. And then oh. it would be you know whatever adventurers it's lured there, and and mm -hmm. they're just like live in the trees or or like they're in the water but they you know they they have to just like barely poke their heads out because they'll otherwise take uh you know take their damage take their so, damage yeah they like just some... swim around in the shallows yeah like a clan of like kuatoa or something like oh, that yeah. <laughs> just seeing like some like apocalypse now shit yeah here's your movie pitch jim yeah Guillermo del Toro finally gets to make his At the Mountains of Madness movie. Okay. But it's an abolith at the end, and it's you take that and Apocalypse Now, smash it together, and the party is the group going into this uh -huh, uh -huh. swampy, awful river and to take on this tyrant that is yeah. that is fucking up river trade with his clan of 
of Kuatoa yeah. cultists. The, the, these Kuatoa cultists, someone else and, has gone missing, maybe. And the whole yeah. party has to try to get to the end of it before going insane and killing each other. Yeah, you could do like the whole, like, they're, they're There's going... There's your D&D movie. Mix Medicine Man with Apocalypse Now. Yeah. And it's just like there's a rare flower or something that's in this area where the Avalith is. And Ooh. the only way to get to it is to go in there and get some back. And, and some, what, what if it's the cure... Yeah. For the disease, cure for the disease for like the the mucusy disease or the yeah that's uh -huh. yeah mm -hmm. and so that's why the apple doesn't destroy it, it keeps yeah. it there because it's it keeps people coming. it keeps people coming it's a lure uh -huh. yeah I can see that and then like it, the party doesn't know anything's wrong until the drills through the bottom of their boat start coming up as the Kuatoa <laughs> <laughs> like just sink their boat with these massive bore drills they come uh -huh. through it yep yeah that's pretty sweet a swamp is pretty sweet I like swamp and and like mangrove forest type stuff just in general they're they're great adventure environments because they yeah. are. They sort of have a, a, they have a claustrophobia, and like we're saying, like the vulnerability of the water is really fun. Yeah, and the limited visibility, both Lim both above the water and below the water. And below the water, but they're still more accessible than deep sea, right? Yeah. Like un deep underwater adventures are one of those things where, like, it, it, I've seen them trip up even large, uh, even like high level parties. The one time I played in Vigilante with you guys, uh, our our you know your DM like set the whole thing underwater, and it was just like. Everybody was like, "Oh shit, we can't!" Like the druid was the only one who had any sort of. Uh, I had I polymorphed with my wizard, which was, thankfully, but it was just yeah. like, "How well, are we going to get out of this?" It's yeah, underwater we, can trip up even twentieth level characters if they're not ready for it. Yeah, if you're not ready for it, if you just drop it on them, that that would be. But yeah, we were fighting Sogwin. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Which apparently is the way you say that. I so, think so. That's what I feel I've good heard. about that. Finally. Yeah. Um, uh, which make good minions for Avalith. Uh, there would be a make a, it would make a great minion. You know right. what I just thought of? An Avalith trap in like a dungeon, underwater cavern. You go into the room that's like. 50 by 50, mm -hmm. the door slams shut behind you, mm -hmm. water starts pouring in, and as it starts pouring in, you then look up and an abolus like <laughs> flops so over the flops edge. Flops over the edge, sure. And yeah. now you, it has dropped in with the party. Like, yeah. Because that's the thing That'd with be an the asshole thing to do. That's what the thing with the Avalith. The real asshole move with the Avalith is to focus fire using all your legendary actions on extra tail attacks, use all your uh, tentacle attacks on the same creature, kill the party member when they drop. Because the Avalith gains the memories of anything it consumes. And to yeah. just be like, all right, the rest of you guys are like enslaved or whatever. I've killed this guy. I'm going to start eating it so that I know everything about you. I know everything that this party member knows. Why y'all are here. Why you're here, what you're up to, mm -hmm. what's going on. And I will devour it. I will devour your friend in front of you so that I know everything that you know. And everything that that party member knew. Now, like getting your friend back is a good like tier three adventure. If you, the DM, just want to kind of f with the party, <laughs> the Abolith sends an agent mm. to be with the party. Yeah, doesn't ever report back. Never, never does anything nefarious. Right, just anything. helps them out. Yeah, they goes been on their since adventure. Like, level two. like, like yeah, like once the yeah. party kind of disrupts the plans early on, and he's like, "This is the I want to scry on you without scrying on you." Yeah. Hey, go go to the party. Help them out. Yeah, for for X amount of time, and then return to me. Yeah, and then that person returns to them, and they eat them. Well, it's got to be the thing where they re they have to return. They have to be like the the long term enslavement. They get a chance to save if they're more than a mile from the island. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So it either needs to be someone who's like utterly devoted to an abolith, and you can take the model of like the kraken priest as mm -hmm. like these priests who are like devoted to the kraken. And you do something else. In fact, I would recommend Crag and Pete Priest as a, a minion that the Aboleth has. Maybe reskin some of the abilities. But maybe there are creatures that worships, worship Aboleths as gods. Yeah. And it could easily be one of these weird villagers that's yeah. by the lake. Or someone that lives along this jungle river that, mm -hmm. that is, has interacted with the Aboleth before. And you're right, like one day they're just gone. No, you never know what happened to them. They yeah. slip away. And while they could just give a report, no, no, no. no, no. I want to hear their, I want to see their words. Yeah, the Aboleth's not going to accept a report. It's, no, no, no. no absolutely it's just going to eat you. Get those memories be like, oh, that's what they know. Absolutely. Good, that's good. I mean. things are progressing right things along. Things are progressing the right along <laughs> as we for have foreseen. So other minions include things like deep spawn, sea yeah. spawn, any of the aquatic creatures, merfolk, tritons, marrow, uh, kuatoa, sagan. You could do cultists, kraken priests. Uh, there used to be a monster called the scum, which was what happens to a person after their skin has turned to jelly. 
long yeah. enough. <laughs> Basically, when you turn into Senator Kelly from the X-Men movie? That's what they look like, right? Yeah, that's I, what I mean. That's what I imagine always. I always imagine them as being like this translucent mm-hmm. jello mold skin that's greasy and slimy, like it's covered with like petroleum jelly or yep. something all the time. It starts and leaking off of them. It starts leaking off of them if they get out of the water. That's why they take the acid uh, mm-hmm. damage from that. And then if it enters their lungs when they're in range of the, the, the abolith. And then when they leave, of course, it expels. And so like, when res- like having to rescue a loved one who's been captured by one of these, right? Like no matter what sort of you know, environment they've got it in, a, 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 you know, an, an Arctic sea or a mangrove uh, you know, swamp or something, like having to rescue someone from an abolith. It's horrendous. It's terrible, it's, right? It's, like. Yeah, like <laughs> the thing about it is even when I was put in, in, in my game, even just reading along to the, with the entry and what it could do and what that, visualizing what the result of that looks like, yeah. like I'd start to gag. Right. Like it is one of those monsters that can be so like repulsive. Oh yeah. Uh, and so alien. Yeah. And that is... That's why we play the game. That's and why I play the game. game. Right? And this is, and Ambleth is a good way of showing like why the best monsters have that repulsive, gross, weird quality to yeah. them. And, and my favorite D&D monsters are not, they're, they're not any of the ones that are like traditional fantasy in that way. They're mostly all aberrations. Mm-hmm. They're mostly these just bizarre monsters from other worlds that have either just weird alien, uh, you know, incomprehensible mindsets or, or, or desires. You know, I, I love the idea that elithids are, are experiencing time backwards. And, and, and we are, it's like, it's like the Doctor and River Song. They're sort of like, they pass each other mm-hmm. in coming. And one point, we will get to a point with the Elithids where they're like, well, who the hell are all these people yeah. that, are, that keep trying to kill us? Like, what is going on? And we are <laughs> sort of like, they're, they're living their life in a different linear progression than we are. And I mm-hmm. like the idea that Aboliths have this memory that's over 400 million years old and that they are both immortal and that every new one that's created has that memory. Yeah. And the, the beholders that are just like, they're nightmares made real and, and that, that existence and the fact that they are obsessed with their own genetic purity and yet there's like dozens of varieties of beholders that they all hate each other yeah and then sometimes people just get in the way of those or why aberrations are so interesting to me as monsters and make such great D D villains because like you can sympathize with an orc you really, I, I really can't, and it's really one of those. I know people like to just kill orcs and shit, and that's fine. But I, it's one of those things for me where I'm like, unless these things are supernaturally created monsters, they're, then they're people, and I don't mind playing in a game where there's some gray and and yeah. you know, are are we enemies with this people? Are we not? But I, I sometimes if you want to do like the monster slaying, just like heroic D and D, I I go with aberrations because it's like. There's no question there. There's, dude, these are just like, yeah, they're, they're, these are, are creatures that, that hate not just you personally, but the fact that things like you exist in the first place. The fact that it's a gross catfish monster just like raises all the sorts of like weird swamp monk creature sort of like, you could just imagine, you know, a storm giant noodling for aboliths or something. <laughs> what was this thing before it became a, a, a weird psychic, you know, tyrant? You yeah. Know? Like, that's why I like them. I think mechanically there are some things you could do to boost an abolith. I think you could give it a better stealth ability right like let it like uh, an abolith well, should be able to to sit still in water and like have sediment settle over them and whatever and the fact that that's not reflected in a stealth score of course as dungeon masters you're free to change this and, and mm-hmm. add situational modifiers yeah instead of the, it has a shit dexterity oh god it does and spam aoe on this thing as fast as possible well yeah i mean like yeah you know, on the player <laughs> side there's yeah there's two things really try not to get too close don't to it don't get too close to it spam yeah. it from distance yeah and whatever you do, do not fucking talk to it. Do not communicate that's the whole with it. Thing. Don't talk to it. Because yeah. it's, it's going to be like whispering in the back of the party's mind as soon the as they're, time. They're, they're, they're getting close yeah. and just just tempting it with this and right. that until maybe it picks up on something, until maybe there's a, what? Yeah. Because that's it's, all it needs, it's, right? It's, yeah, and this is worthwhile to point out that telepathic communication, as written in, in, in fifth edition, is not like mind reading. It's not like I know what you're thinking and that's how we're talking. It is voluntary two-way communication. If the other party does not respond, then there's no telepathy that happens. It's just you have an opportunity to. Now, Dungeon Masters will want to figure out, is the Abolith aware of 
you know, who's within its telepathy range. And, and in that sense, does it act like a minor version of detect thoughts where it's like, okay, I at least know I could talk to someone. I don't know what they are, right. what they well, want. I just see it as just yelling out of its mind That's out to 120 way. feet. Yeah, it and, just and once you get in that, yeah, yeah, once you get in within that, then it hears you. In terms of like other things you could do to boost it, I mentioned before better senses, maybe maybe by, uh, blind sense or something like that. Um, uh, what I want is the ability for the Aboleth to sit in a cloud of obscurement in the water to like it use its tentacles to like you know break up a bunch of this, the, the ocean floor and create a sort of cloud of sediment but I want them to still be able to see out but the party can't see in mm -hmm. sort of like uh, um, um, the well, way that say a warlock uses darkness uh, with devil sight yeah kind of you situation. can see you can see through yeah. it uh, much like the Neogi masters have right like Neogi uh, masters or just like a I could see like a blind sense like 30 feet Sure. Yeah. There, so that's I mean, the, that's, that's the sense of its enslavement ability. Yeah. It's uh, the yeah. yeah. It's the range of sure. its enslavement. It yeah. could create a thir like a thirty foot cloud, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. And just kind of sit inside of it. And if yeah. you yeah, if you come in that like, it could be bad news for you. It could Those be three tentacle attacks, a tail swipe. Yeah, enslavement. It, it could be cool. I mean, that's <laughs> it could be really cool. Yeah, that, that's the other thing. Getting in melee with the creature like an abolith, it, this thing hits like a truck, and if it focuses its fire, it you know it does considerable damage. So like, mm -hmm. staying outside of melee with it's a big deal. Um, it, it, it'd be neat if it had a move action as a legendary action. I yeah. would. I might take that over the psychic drain. I, I can't ever really see myself using psychic drain because it's number one, it costs two actions, and it's only three d six. Yeah. If it was like a fixed number, like this, like I can drain all of this creature's hit points to gain it back. But I'm sorry, like a, an average of ten damage, three d six. By the time the the parties, by the time the Avalith would be facing party members, three d six damage that it can heal for two legendary actions is not going to keep this thing in mm -hmm. the fight. It, 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 unless it's got like massive amounts of minions, like Call Sartan had, where it was like it's got fifty minions it can choose from to to psychically drain, and it's got three or four rounds to do nothing else but use those two legendary actions mm -hmm. to psychically drain. That's yeah. another thing. If you're gonna like stall the party for a few rounds to heal up, yeah, that's it. It is more of a uh, in between combat ability. Like it's like oh, you, you had a scrap. I'm gonna go back to my lair, yeah. knit my wounds quicker than normal. Yeah. And be, probably, and be ready the next day. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Although at the same time, it's like you could just take a short rest and use a hit die. Well, <laughs> which is that, the other thing. There's, right? there's that too. But uh, I mean, because that's how I that's how I used it in right. y'all's fight. Yeah, yeah. I think it's for a combat sort of like if you can force a lull between uh, you know something. If you can send in a wave of minions that that distracts the party long enough, you know they have to clear out a bunch of them so that then the Aboleth can move off uh, in a different direction, drain a bunch of minions that it keeps just on hand for this purpose. A little, you know, pissant kuatoa or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it can sort of, uh, you know, come back into the fight and, and be refreshed that way. Um, at the same time, you know, the, the, if things go badly for this Aboleth, unless the party has freedom of movement or a swim speed, Aboleth can probably get away from them. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially if they've if it's kind of kept its distance, uh, you know, to begin with, um, and then I, I might give the Aboleth some psionic ability as well if I wanted to like increase its power. Just pick some spells that it can use a certain number of times per day or at will or something. To if I really wanted to make this thing the villain of a campaign, then yeah. I would give it some some abilities like detect thoughts, modify memory. Uh, those seem like appropriate things, like an Aboleth being able to modify a creature's memory. That that seems very appropriate for an Aboleth. So it worships, but it doesn't know it worships because it's the face in the uh -huh. town? Uh -huh. That kind of thing, mm -hmm. yeah. A, short, a more short-term uh, sort of charm ability, I can see as well, like a short, like, like access to like dominate. Uh, I can see it having as, as a less, uh, you know, it's just like, oh, I just need you for a minute. Right, you right. Know, uh, that kind of thing. So I, I can see it giving it some psionics to make it a bit beefier. I know that Tome of Beasts has an undead version of the Aboleth called a Nihilith <laughs> or Ooh. something. I haven't really checked that one out uh, yet, but that one looks really cool. Uh, Aboleth's version of an Alhoun uh, mm -hmm. is what, uh, what you get. Well, and like, like we uh, briefly mentioned earlier, um, if the party is triumphant, that's still not the end. That's still not the end. Because all they do, their body reforms in the right. plane of water. Yeah. And they remember you, and they always will. And they remember you, and always will. Yeah, they and always so, will. Yeah. It's, good victory. It's Keep looking over your shoulder. Good victory. Keep looking over your shoulder. Don't go to the plane of water unless you have to.
This has fucked me. Okay, they went, they, they, no, he went, came back. I swear to God, dude walked right up to the door and was about to come in. Yeah, some the, dude just the, walked in. Yeah, wa yeah, wanting to give us discounts on like, oil changes. You know, a discount on oil change? Like, we I was do like, listen, work. fam, I don't know if this is the lingo now, but yeah. uh, we're good. Don't, there's no one. Where was I? You were it, out. It's when you were going to Star Starbucks yesterday. This? But he, okay. he's like, hey, we're over here and we're just giving out to businesses in the area. And we're like, well, we don't own we're this. Just, yeah, we're, we're just renting. renting. This space. <laughs> so we're good. We're good. Well, do y'all pay for, what do you pay for oil changes? Like, <laughs> <laughs> myself. Jim, Jim was like, I don't live here. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't have a car. <laughs> what are we, how did we get here? <laughs> Mister! <laughs> I'm an adult. Where's Travis? <laughs> Sorry. Then I just come out going, out! You get out! 